ابتدایی یه فرصت خوب حالا پشت مدافع خدا داد عزیزی توی دروازه گل گل برای ایران خدا داد عزیزی پاس هم روی زمین یک به سردار آسمون به توی دروازه سردار آسمون گل به نام آسمون به برای ایران بزنه کریم ازداری فرد گل توی هرموزه کریم ازداری فرد درموزه پرتفال باز شد علی ازداری سامه تو توی هرموزه ازداری یه اشتباه حرکت از کوچان نجات پرسه بره کوچان نجات توی درموزه گل برای ایران everyone and welcome to another episode of Gold Bazan. Today I'm joined by Arya and Samson. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Hey, good to be back on uh, in front of, uh, I guess, in front of a camera or something. But uh, yeah, what's up, guys? Yeah, it's good to be back on uh, back on the, the, the camera, as you said, Samson, and doing a podcast uh, about the national team. Uh, so yeah, good to be on. Yeah, we've got our videos on. So for anyone listening on audio, if you want to see our pretty faces, then you can go on Apple Podcast, on, on YouTube, and uh yeah view us in in hd or whatever so yeah um so today on the podcast i want to talk about a few different things with the friendlies coming up um the final squad preparation for the world cup a lot of different things behind the scenes there's a lot of small things that we need to cover for this episode so i'm really excited but before we go on um if you missed it we did do an episode with gareth southgate we, we interviewed the england manager asked him a lot of good questions aria was was and and cena were, were talking to him um, just very quickly, Arya, what was your like impressions of Gareth Southgate? Just so for people to to know if they haven't listened. No, he's a great, he's a great guy. Obviously, you know, I think everyone kind of sees that in him. He's uh, a true, true gentleman. I think the obviously we've got to thank the FA for first of all inviting us down to to do the interview. Um, it was for a, an international media day, um, something that you know you don't get that often from federations, but it's good, good to see that they organised it. And um, yeah, we asked him some tough questions, some pretty simple questions, and he he gave us answers um, as a, as a manager should do. Obviously, uh, sometimes he was uh, maybe not gonna give you the answer that you wanted, but you know it is what it is. I think it was good. It's good for us to do the interview, and we asked the right questions. I think that day, and um, obviously the, the sound quality didn't come out the best. But um, if you wanna if you wanna read it, it, we've got a transcript for it, which our writer Alex. Uh, did on the website he was definitely mm. he was definitely a bit diplomatic though wasn't he Aria? yeah i mean they always are ex- they always to are ex- to be fair actually on the day we spoke to other journalists that had in- interviewed him from various other media outlets uh from germany for example that come over um and we asked them like what kind of questions are you asking southgate um and they're like oh it's all political questions so he was getting literally bombarded with political questions the full day uh, actually, when we interviewed him before we started, he was like, you know, it's probably going to be a bit different now because it's about football, <laughs> and you know, um, it was. You know, obviously we asked him about the the protests in 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 Iran, but other than that, it was mainly about football, and I think I think he kind of appreciated that as well. Um, so again, really great. Uh, really, I want to say thank you to um Andy Walker as well, the FA's media officer for for uh, bringing us in, and hopefully going forward. We can do more of these things and um, work with the uh, the English uh, FA uh, regarding interviewing. Maybe we play England again in the next World Cup. You never know. <laughs> yeah, and Cena, Cena, sorry to, to interrupt, uh, but uh, I myself, I, I put in a lot of work trying to organize some, something with the U.S. Federation. Uh, oh, yeah, I, this is I, important to know, actually. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I was in touch with uh, some of their media officers as well. Uh completely transparent uh me and uh aria and i you know we you know, figured out what we would send and you know how and and i do this with my day job too and in, in contacting media offices for different entities and all that and uh the just to be completely transparent with our listeners the uh media contact that i was mainly uh in contact with uh would take quite a while to get back to me never did hear back i i, I mean i would I would I would even reach out and say hey I'll be in Chicago because I was I was in town for uh I just happened to be in Chicago which is where the U.S. Federation uh, building is uh in their main office and I said hey I can meet this day uh this you know we can embargo it just like England did uh mm-hmm. because they had their own press day we showed up for that we were speaking with Gareth Southgate how can we 
meant something with um, Greg Berhalter or anyone really from the national team camp. And uh, they, they, they kind of, you know, re- respond weeks later and then weeks later again, and then weeks later again, this, this whole process started in August, mind you. Um, mm. And uh, yeah. Uh, so fast forward to, you know, two weeks from uh, the world cup and uh, it, nothing really materialized. So, so, so everyone wanting to know, maybe our U.S. based listeners, yes, we did try. Who knows? Maybe something can work itself out in the next two weeks, or when Cena and Alex are in uh, Qatar. Uh, but we did try uh, for the uh, pre World Cup stuff. Mm. Yeah, Samson, you definitely tried very hard to get some sort of an interview and an insight into what's going on behind the scenes in the U.S. national team camp, but literally nothing. So we did try for you guys. We tried very hard, but didn't didn't happen um but anyway let's i will, let's add, I will add just very quickly as well on the welsh um, coach rob page they they've had a lot of um, requests from international media so they just they told me straight away that that's not possible for us to interview uh, in terms of carlos kirosh uh more difficult with what's going on uh again with the protests and, and various other things uh we did do something with him out in austria so that might come out in the next couple of weeks so just be stay tuned for that one Okay, before we go on though, guys, I want to quickly share some some news. And it was that the Iran Beach Soccer International Intercontinental Cup win. They beat Brazil in the final 2-1 in Dubai. It was an amazing victory, of course, especially just before the 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 real world, the, the bigger World Cup. Um, they didn't celebrate the, the trophy ceremony though, which is which is which is ex- ex- expected. Um Said Piramun, who who scored the goal. Uh, did a haircutting celebration as well that I know will will relay so you can you can watch it now. Um, which obviously is like very very strong symbolism, and we've seen that kind of across a lot of different celebrations. So, yeah, it was a very nice message. I I, I liked seeing that. You know, it, it, it's symbolizing, you know, the um, the coming of Masa Amini, who, who we spoke about um, with Gareth Southgate as well. Uh, you know, she was she was killed for not wearing her hijab properly. And I think that's that's the that's the message he's trying to send with that celebration, which is a brave thing to do. Um, there are reports that when he goes back, when the B soccer team goes back to Iran, that there could be issues for them. Um, we hope not, uh- of course. I've heard they've already gone back. I don't know. This, these are just like rumors that spread around, but I've heard they've already gone back and no, like they just didn't let any media go anywhere close to them. Right. But I don't know. Maybe that's a rumor. Well, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. So we, we'll see what happens. I think going forward, hopefully nothing bad happens to them. Yeah. yeah and they, and, and, and what we're seeing guys is so many more athletes are doing this across yeah. multiple sports. Uh, not um, just Iranian as well. Yes. Not just and, and, and men and women. Uh, and especially, uh, what we saw with, uh, I believe, uh, Esther Glaub, correct? Yeah, we'll come on to that later on as well. Yeah, they, they didn't celebrate their Iranian Super... Uh, in fact, we'll just speak about it now. The Iranian Super Cup victory over uh, Nasa G, which they won uh, 1-0. Uh, <laughs> تحویل سید حسین حسینی میدم و حالا کاپ قهرمانی رو بالای دست میبره is a massive trophy not to like diminish it it's not a massive trophy but of course they would still celebrate it um and they didn't celebrate it on the pitch um, i don't know what they did afterwards maybe they did celebrate it afterwards but they didn't do it on the pitch and uh yeah i think um we're seeing that across sports. We're seeing that across uh, our, some of the legionnaires. Some of them are, are now celebrating. Like Tarami is now uh, celebrating his goals, for example. Uh, that's his choice. Uh, but a lot of players aren't. Uh, for instance, Majid Hosseini is getting his teammates to not celebrate in Kayseri Sport, which is quite, uh, quite, fine, uh, quite interesting, quite intriguing to do that. Uh, but other than that, yeah, um, brave of the the beach soccer players and I good to see that from the STL players as well. Yeah, incredibly brave. And as 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 we mentioned before, it wasn't it's not just the Iranian athletes that are doing this, but it's, it goes across the board, which is yeah. which is incredibly nice to see. And, and, and we, saw, to mention, we saw Tony yeah. 
to mention yeah. as well, just on top of that, we forgot to mention, they didn't actually sing the anthem at the beat soccer match in any of the games. They didn't Very sing the anthem. Point. So, and that's one of the main reasons why I think there people are saying that there could be issues for them to go back to Iran because uh, they didn't sing the anthem, uh, national anthem of the of the the country just now, and uh, they, you know, very all of them were even the the coaching staff didn't sing it. So you know, again, it's brave from that respect. Yeah, all I'm going to say is it's going to be a very interesting watch to see the senior like men team at the World Cup to see what happens there because they obviously the platform is like far bigger. Um players are very politically charged so we'll, we'll see like it's a very it's a very interesting world cup and i i don't like i haven't seen a world cup like this so yeah very interesting to see for sure but as i was saying it doesn't just go across iranian athletes tony Kroos, uh real madrid player of course showed support for the iranian people also uh which you can obviously see now if you're watching on youtube this is tony Kroos, and this is a video of support for all the brave people in iran fighting for women rights human rights democracy and freedom I see you and join you in saying woman, life, freedom. Right. So let's move on to the preview again for the Iran against Nicaragua game um, at the Azadi Stadium in Tehran, uh, November 10th, 7.30 p.m. local time. And this game is a friendly, obviously, preparing for the World Cup that kicks off on the 21st of November. This is just domestic players. Um, it's important to note. We did a quick interview with Nicaraguan football expert Camilo Velasquez from Football Nica. All right, I'm joined by Camilo Velasquez, a good friend of ours from uh, Nicaragua. Obviously, you you covering Nicaraguan football. How are you, my friend? Hey, how are you? Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, good to have you on the the, the podcast. Uh, just speak to us about your work um, for Nicaraguan football. Uh, and you know what you do on Twitter, for example, what, what kind of stuff do you do currently? Yeah, so I'm the general director for Football Nica. We are the um, first and number one independent and digital media group to cover Nicaraguan soccer. So we've been uh, doing this for the past 15 years and we uh, we only speak about Nicaraguan football. So um, just following you know, first division, second division, third tire, fourth tire. And uh, we uh, we take pride in saying that we are the only news group to follow the Nicaragua national team wherever they go or most places wherever they go. And we are on social media as at Football Nica. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, make sure you follow Football Nika on Twitter and other social media as well. Um, okay, let's speak about the Nicaraguan international team. Obviously, they just called up their squad list uh, recently. Um, are there any major surprises or changes uh, that that have been from the previous squad? And also speak to us about the recent results that you guys have had. Yeah, so um, what's happening in Nicaragua is that there's a new coach, so Chilean trainer. Marco Antonio Figueroa, who was a, a major goal scorer in the Mexican League um, when, when he was a player, took over. Uh, and he's being backed up by a group of uh, Mexican consultants who are in charge of managing the Nicaragua seniors team image and activities, right? So it's very, it's very weird because sometimes it's... Uh, you speak about Nicaragua in general terms, but the work that they're doing is specifically for the senior team, right? So this doesn't involve um, U23, U21, U U17. Um, this is mainly seniors team. So um, it's like it's like two independent bodies. But um, they came they came last year to Nicaragua with the promise of taking Nicaragua. And making them making Nicaragua qualify to the um, World Cup in um, in 2026. So that's you know that's the goal that they have set. Which in particular, I think it's an impossible goal to reach. Um, so what's been happening is that they have been able to make Nicaragua play fantastic friendly matches that we probably couldn't think about um, about last year. So. Um, for example, Nicaragua has played recently against Ghana. We lost 1-0. We play against Qatar. We lost 2-1. to one. 
we also played a friendly match against Suriname. We lost two to one. And now we're playing Iran, right? Which is probably the best team that we're going to be facing um, within the last couple of years. And, um, and the objective is for Nicaragua, the main objective is for Nicaragua to qualify to the CONCACAF Gold Cup, but also, which is the big thing that it's coming up in March, um, is qualifying to Nations League A in CONCACAF region. So right now, Nicaragua is playing CONCACAF League B or Nations League B, and we are sharing group with Trinidad and Tobago, bah Bahamas, and St. Vincent and the Granadines. Nicaragua is leading the group with um, 10 points. Trinidad has nine. And then we have two big games coming up in March. So St. Vincent in Managua, and then visiting Trinidad and Tobago, which uh, it's going to rule which team goes to Nations League A. So that's a little, a little um, general summary on, on what's happening around the Nicaragua national team. And, and just on, on, on the current squad then, uh, is there any uh, kind of major changes, any injuries or... Uh... Yeah, so what's happening is that Figueroa has a, um, a very particular view on starting working on the team that he wants ready for 2026, right? Which to me is a bit weird. But um, so, so he's bringing to Iran a group of 19 players. You can actually find that information uh, within Football Nica. Uh, And, and it's mainly a group. So the average age for this group traveling to Iran is 24 years and 152 days. So it's a very young, very young squad of uh, Nicaraguan players. I wouldn't say there's any major surprises. We, um, we're, we're not traveling with any of our players except one who's playing abroad. And, um, and the reason is, I guess Figueroa wants to start giving these young players this international experience that we've been lacking historically, right? So I guess the, the major surprise that we're having from this squad traveling to Tehran is um, how young it is. And, and it's mainly a group of players playing out of the Nicaraguan League, which is not a great league. Um, except for one player, Brian Lopez, who plays for Sporting FC in, in the uh, Costa Rican First League. And uh, interesting you brought up that as well, players playing abroad. Um, previously, there was an Iranian player who played, uh, sorry, uh, a Nicaraguan player who played in the Iranian League, uh, goes by the name of uh, Carlos Chavarria, uh, Chavarria, and uh, he played for Pai de Jorazan, or currently called Sharif Odro. Um, he's not part of the squad, but you know what kind of connection from that does Nicaragua have with Iran, and and how did that spell go for for this player? Yeah, it's very curious because you you said it right. Um, Nicaragua has not been traditionally a country that exports uh, football players, right? And um, so having someone playing abroad has been a major thing for us. So anywhere a Nicaraguan goes, we follow. And this has been changing, right? Lately, now we have about 14 players playing abroad, um, which has also come hand to hand with the growth that Nicaraguan football has been experiencing. Carlos, Carlos Chavarria is, um, uh, is a player who actually decided to retire from professional football last year. Um, He, we saw him growing up as a, as a young player uh, with, with Real Esteli. So Real Esteli is the, the major team in Nicaragua, kind of like Persopolis has been in, in Iran, right? Um, and so Carlos grew up among this foundation of the best club in Nicaragua, which is Real Esteli. And, uh, and then we saw him grow within... The, the Nicaragua national team. So U17, U19, U20. He had a, a, gr a great goal scoring record as well for this, for this club. He scored a lot of goals between 2013. Yeah. And, and you know what, if you could, if you could create, like if we, if we had like a power index that kind of value the importance of goals that Carlos Chavarria scored for Nicaraguan football, um, I think he would have one of the highest power index because he scored With the Nicaragua national team, he scored very important goals. So 
Um, to give you an idea, Carlos scored the first and only goal that Nicaragua has until this time in the Gold Cup, which is the most important competition where we've played. He scored a goal against Panama. He scored goals in the, in the qualifying round for Russia 2018, uh, including one in Jamaica, which gave Nicaragua its biggest victory so far, uh, a two to three victory in Kingston. So he was a big promise for, uh, for Nicaraguan football. And he played in Spain, he played in Malta, and then he moved to um, Iran where he played with Palidez. So this made us follow a league that we only knew every four years when the World Cup came and we needed to learn about Iran. Um, it, it wasn't a league that we necessarily follow until Carlos came to this team. And then we started learning and reading about the Iranian league. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it was, it was good to have it. It didn't last long. I think there was a lot of cultural and, and then the language barriers uh, kind of stroke. Carlos did a good job. Um, he, he played, he started some matches, he assisted. Um, and, and so I, I think he, he left a good, a, a good image. Uh, but I did think that the cultural barrier, the language barrier were also uh, some yeah. issues. And then his agent um, moved him to Tunisia where he then played with the African, African club, which is a big club in Tunis, right? And then Carlos kind of got tired. He decided to retire from, uh, from football. And he was very young. I, I mean, 24 years old when he decided to retire. Um, but yeah, that link, that link Nicaragua and football to Iran for a while. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting now, obviously, you're, you're, you know, you guys are going to compete against the national team. It won't be the full national team, of course. It will be uh, predominantly domestic based players. So from the Iranian league, as we're just, we're just discussing there, a couple of players will be from the Qatari league, but potentially maybe some from Europe, um, depending on the cl clubs that go a lot earlier than the normal. So basing that off, of what the facts that we know, the players that you have caught, how do you think this game is going to go for these uh, young uh, players in, in Nicaragua? And what kind of an experience do you think that you hope they take away from this? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think we're very uh, realistic about the game. Iran is obviously favorite, even though um, it might not have its main players. So, uh, like, our perception is that this, this is a Nicaraguan group who's learning who's um, creating bricks and, and, and creating the foundations for, you know, a team that it's trying to, to grow and, and playing best, better teams is, is the best way to, to grow. Right. So, you know, we're expecting, we're expecting for Nicaragua to perform similar to what they did with Ghana, which is a, a team that it's very well structured from, uh, from, from the defense Um I don't think Nicaragua will build too many chances in attack, but, but we're expecting a, a tight game, right? Like we, we think Iran, it's, it's favorite. I think Iran should win, but hopefully we're able to see uh, a Nicaraguan team that's able to, to defend well. And then hopefully we can yeah. see what we haven't seen against Ghana. It's hard to talk about the game against Qatar because Qatar didn't allow any recording. We couldn't see the match. Um, but I think what, what I would like to see, uh, like in um, comparing to the game against Ghana, is I would like to see Nicaragua uh, transitioning into attack one or twice against Iran. I think that would, um, that would mark some improvement against the last game yeah. that we were able to see. Thanks a lot, Camila. I appreciate your time. Uh, also, just or also, uh, if you want to follow his uh, um, Twitter account, it's uh, Football Nika. Um, and yeah, again, thanks for coming on the podcast. Of course, no, and I just would like to say, um, maybe people from Iran who who listen to the podcast are not aware, but um, in Nicaragua, for example, there's a there's a, a high consumption, right, like in Iran of European football, and so Mehdi Taremi is is a figure that we know pretty well, um, and from when I was younger, Ali Dai, uh, who are you know, they they're both linked, right, Taremi and, and Ali Dai, yeah. um, was also a player that we follow Mehdi Mahavikia as well. So uh, we, we know more than what you know about us, that's for sure. And that only comes uh, hand to hand by, by how much um, the, the Iranian football 
uh, has grown and, and how big of a superpower you are in Asia. So um, this has been really interesting talking to you and sharing a little bit the view of Nicaragua's national team. I would like to highlight two Nicaraguan players for you to follow in the game. Um, please pay special attention to midfielder Harold Medina and Whitman Talavera, who's a offensive winger also. So those are two, two players that I would follow um, in, in Nicaragua, and, and hopefully Nicaragua could represent a good challenge for this Iranian team um, in, in your way to, to World Cup. Good luck for Thanks um, a lot. Iran as well. I appreciate in that. Qatar. Thanks a lot, my friend. Uh, we'll speak soon. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Now, quickly, are there any injuries for this game? Yeah, there are uh, obviously no injuries for this game. Uh, there are injuries for the next game against Tunisia. Um, uh, obviously, Sardar Osman is still recovering from injury. He'll be back this week, uh, this weekend for for Bayer Leverkusen. Um, I think Ahmad Nurlahi. I think the uh, UAE league is still going on. So I think even if he was fit, I think he would have missed this game anyway because he wouldn't have been able to come. Um, other than that. Uh, no, there's no other injuries. Uh, Vai Naimiri is back from injury now. I think he's had it, that back injury that he he played in in the a few of the league games now. Uh, other than that, uh, no. Obviously, Alayar won't, won't get to the World Cup, so that's us uh, for injuries. Yeah, let's talk about Osman very very quickly because I know people obviously want to know would what's it looking like in terms of the World Cup in terms of his injury. Um, look. It was a bad injury, you know. The calf, a calf injury, is a hard one because there's a lot of muscles in that region of your leg, and you've got to when you recover, it, it it's not hard to recover all the little muscles in, in that, in in that in that part of your of your leg. So I think for him, uh, working with the the team Melly uh, physiotherapist Mikel Morera, a good friend of ours, we met out in Austria as well. Uh, we spoke to him. Um, he's done some uh, personal work with him uh, in the UAE. He's back now with his club, and as, as I said, he's he's going to be back to full fitness. I think for for the the game this weekend. That's fantastic news. Obviously, it's a huge loss if if he doesn't make it. I know, obviously, England's got a lot of injuries, so. It's it's probably a good a good thing for us if if we can have a full fully fit squad, um. That's so yeah, it'd be good to see him. It, it, seeing it in Aria, that that's what I've been curious about because I, I've been trying to keep track of the different injuries, uh, for the teams in Group B. I haven't heard much of of any struggles that Wales have, but the United States they haven't as of this recording have not released uh any clear announcements with their roster, uh n- neither has. England uh yet I believe but I mean England and US that they're a little bit scrambling to try to organize themselves when it comes to uh these these injuries I believe it's Chilwell who's going to miss the World Cup that was already announced uh Mm -hmm. several players for the for the United States are are big question marks plus they can't even I mean no one even knows who's going to be the the center backs for the United States so it's the same story for them as it's been the last two years so a lot of open yeah. questions that I, I think if you're Iran, uh, Kairos is telling them to keep their head down and not worry about the other teams, of course, but it is interesting to see these other teams not have any clear cut uh, plans with their, with their squad. I mean, we'll obviously find out more in the days to come, but uh, this, this is a bit alarming. If you're, if you're fans of England in the United States. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, um, there have been some major injury issues for England. Obviously, at fullback, as you mentioned, uh, Chilwell, also Reese James. Who Reece James I, is big. I, I rate him really highly. I think he's one of their best players. Um, and uh, he's injured. He's going to miss the World Cup. From what we're what we're the last news we had, um, I think uh, Trent, um, the right back for Liverpool, he's probably going to miss the World Cup. Maybe he'll not be fit for the Iran game. We'll, we'll see. No, he's uh, playing. He's playing. Is he, he just, playing? Yeah, he's right. playing, but he just... I don't know what, if what he about, could be trusted at full, but at, at right back. What about Kyle, defensively, he's not good. What about Kyle Walker? Was he not... Injured? Kyle Walker's out. So he's um, out. So he's, he's out. Harry Maguire's then. only just come back from injury. He's, he's not playing badly, to be fair, but he's a bit, he's a bit questionable. Um, so yeah, they, they just do have injuries in a few different areas. So Alexander Arnold probably starts at right back for England then. So yeah, I think yeah. um 
I think they've got uh, they've got good enough depth to to cover those spots. I don't think there's an issue with that in that respect. Obviously, you've got guys like Luke Shaw, for example, at left back. It's not 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 an issue, but I think they would have liked to have had Reese James playing. Um, with Wales, I'm not sure if they have any major injuries. Uh, not to not seen that at all yet. Obviously, I think Gareth Bale that he just won the um, MLS Cup. Yeah, he he's gonna be a bit hungover, I think, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see how he's feeling uh, when it comes to the World Cup. But um, yeah, I think uh, with, with with regards to the opponents, it doesn't it doesn't really matter, does it? You know, we need to think about ourselves, you know, because uh, mm. we've had our own injury issues, and I think. Um, there's one more game. There's one more uh weekend of games for the Legionnaires. Hopefully, no one, nobody gets any injuries, and we go to this competition with a, a full slate. Mm. Knock on oh. wood. Get get your get your evil eye ready. <laughs> uh, hanging on the on the dash of your car, and yeah. uh, get get a rabbit's uh, foot. All, get everything. And pray. <laughs> Uh, what do you see now? Just before you move on, let's let's cover the Nicaragua game as well. We'll I was literally about to ask that question. Yeah. 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 All right, okay, so okay. about about the Nicaragua game, what what do we want to get out of it? Like, obviously, we want to get a, a victory, but this is this isn't our first team. This is just the domestic players. So, what sort of, I guess, what do we want to get out of it? I guess. Oh, for it's it's not going to be a game. That includes Legionnaires. It's going to include the Qatari base players. So uh, Khalid Zadeh, Kanani, and Omid Ibrahim will be there, uh, despite some confusion at the beginning of the camp. They will be there. Uh, there will be some U21 players there as well, uh, quite a few of them that have been called up uh, just to kind of fill the numbers up, fill, fill some positions up for the, for the squad. Um, good, young, good young players uh, like Arya uh, Bazagar, for example, he was playing his uh, trade in... Uh, in Belarus quite recently is back in Iran now. Um a few other players as well. Shariat Zadeh, who's quite a good talented player. Sadeh, who plays in the Estek well. So I there's a couple of good talented players there, but I think majority of the players will will be with likes of likes of um Milad Salak who plays in, in Paris Police, for example. Uh you like Abul Faz Jalali who played against Uruguay was quite impressive. Obviously Prali Ganji, Rezon Yon, Bayron Van, all these players will still be in the squad. So it it should be a fairly simple game, as uh, Camilo was saying. It seems like Nicaragua are gonna go to this game with a younger squad, uh, with a perspective for the twenty twenty six World Cup. So they're bringing a younger squad so that they can they can be ready for the next World Cup. So it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting game. I think it's important for these uh, domestic play- based players to to get some experience, uh, just playing some more football because obviously not a lot of them played in the last two friendlies. So yeah, it's just a a filler uh, just to get some more games on the on the on the pitch. Mm. I would Some think I, I would think the name of the game well, first thing is to you know attain chemistry and try for the players who are kind of on the outside edge looking in to to make an impression, put some pressure on Caros to make one of his uh, uh, surprising uh, final final roster spots uh, in their favor. But I I would think name of the game in terms of tactics i would think is in the likes of possess right nick ragwa i mean let's put with all due respect they're not the yeah. the biggest team in the in the world are they i mean they're not even if they were playing their, their best players they still weren't going to be much of a challenge it's not like it's not about that it's not about winning or losing i think as you say it's about uh just um honing down how we're going to play because the U.S. In my opinion, I think the U.S. are the definite underdogs in this uh, in this in this group. Maybe not by ranking, but by quality. I don't think they have as much quality as the Welsh and the Iran and and the English team for sure. So I think it does put us in a position where you know we're going to keep the ball against the USA likely. So how are we going to play? So I think it's important to have the the domestic based players understand what's expected of them. But also, it's great to, that, that there's going to be some younger players, and you know, for the for the next Asian Cup, you know, the, the K Roche keeps an eye on these players, and hopefully, if he stays on beyond the World Cup, he can bring these guys back in. Mm. There'll be there'll be probably like I don't know two or three players from this team that um, could definitely fill in if there is an injury as well. That's that's an important thing. Like yeah, so so obviously, it's good to test them. And and obviously they 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 know that themselves, so they're going to be you know putting a lot of effort in this game. 
uh, to prove themselves so that if someone is to get injured or they can, you know, to get a call up on the subs bench, if they are called into action, at least they have the game time on the national team in, in a fairly competitive game, I guess, because they're competing amongst themselves more than anything uh, for a spot. So I think it's overall positive. I think it's good to do this. Um, I don't know. Are the national teams doing a friendly this this close to the game? Is that is that the normal thing? Because some people have said that like we shouldn't be no. doing friendlies. We should protect the players. No, well, it is these are these aren't um, FIFA international friendly sanctioned. I don't think maybe the T- Tunisia game is. I'm not sure. I don't think they're sanctioned by FIFA. If they are, then it's like uh, it's been expedited. So it's been done last minute by FIFA to to allow us to go through. Uh, considering the schedule for this World Cup is a lot more different to the to the usual schedule when you have one in the summer, mm-hmm. uh, I think uh, it's it's good though that we've got two friendlies because I, we were expecting that game against Senegal to be our last game, right? I mean, we were saying that that's going to be our last game and we're ready to go play against England, but you no, know, we've got two more games. Uh, Tunisia game is actually quite a good friendly. I think it's a good last uh, friendly before we go out to Qatar. So yeah, um, um, uh, hopefully this and this can be successful. Have we heard anything about uh, which games will be behind closed doors? Because if it's like the last couple of World Cups, the last friendly typically is behind closed doors with the, uh, with the intended lineup for the first World Cup match. I feel like they're both behind closed doors, no? I I, I would assume the Nicaragua game will be broadcast because it's obviously in Aldi Stadium. I think the State TV, national state TV will, will probably broadcast it because they want to make money, for example. You know, might as well broadcast it. Uh, the Tunisia game, it's in Doha. I don't know if it's going to be at a stadium. I think it's just going to be in a training ground, um, similar to how they played uh, Lithuania uh, before the 2018 World Cup. That was like a, a basically a training friendly behind closed doors. Uh, I think we played against Iraq get ended before the 2019 Asian Cup if I'm not mistaken that was also behind closed doors so uh, that one is likely to be behind closed doors but uh, you know we'll, we'll still cover it of course but we'll, uh, maybe maybe if a, maybe if media is allowed then they'll have like a live stream for it on Instagram or something on like our stories or whatever but it, it won't I, don't, I doubt that would be like that would be broadcast on TV hmm so just to remind you guys listening, it's on the 10th of November at 7.30 local time. And and obviously, if you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, we're going to be posting uh, you know, what, what that time is in your time zone. So definitely follow us there. Now, before we go on, um, a quick bit of news as well. Javod Nekulnam turned down the assistant job, um, you know, the number two role. Before we go on to like who would likely be that number two role, why did he turn it down? Like what's the, what's the news there? Uh well obviously currently the the, the assistant coach is Roger De Sa, there from South Africa he uh, is the number two they wanted to have an Iranian number two uh obviously for Skocic that was uh, Vaid Hashemian who was there for uh, Mark Wilmots as well he didn't stay on so they kind of wanted to bring somebody in to fill in that gap that that void of an Iranian uh coach in the team because uh, currently there isn't one uh so. Um, Jawad Nekunam was Kairos's uh, first choice. He'd said it right from the beginning in his first press conference that he wants to bring Jawad Nekunam back. He'd previously coached under him, if you remember, uh, in, in, the, in the previous qualification campaign that he was in charge of. Uh, so, you know, he, he was very adamant that he wanted him back. We even spoke to uh, Nabi, I think, just before the Senegal game, just asked him what's going on, going on with that. And he said... You know, it's, we need to go back to Iran and negotiate. Of course, that has now happened. They they didn't finalize it. And what happened was, uh, Fulad, the club that is currently at, uh, didn't seem too keen on letting him go and you know go away from the team and then come back. And that was one of the main issues. I think Nekunam as well, from what we're hearing, wanted to be guaranteed, uh, the head job that Kirosh has after he leaves, so after the, the World Cup. So when the Asian Cup comes around this time next year, maybe in January next year, he wants to be able to be the guy in charge for that. He wants to be, he wants to be guaranteed. And I don't, that's what we heard. You know, Maybe that's not true, but that's what we heard. 
and he didn't accept it on those terms that he wasn't going to be given that guarantee. So I think um, it is what it is. Both parties didn't agree and he didn't get it. Uh, and now uh, it seems that Mark Aragajanian, who obviously we've had on a podcast uh, twice, he's a good friend of ours. We speak to him quite regularly. He's, a, he's a, somebody that um got a lot of respect for. Uh, he um he has been obviously part of the national team for eight years under Cairo. She might come back, so we, I've not have, I've not spoke to him yet. Um, so we'll see what what happens with him. Hopefully, he comes back and he's the, the Iranian coach at the World Cup. Hmm. I don't see that we'll update you guys when that happens, or if that happens. That is a loss though to not have a presence like like Nekunam during mm. the World Cup, just because of that one condition. That's. I mean, you know, we're not in the room. We don't know exactly what was discussed, but that's that's a loss nonetheless for the players. Yeah, he's and a big I, presence. I he's a huge presence. I I don't think he was coming in to make us a better team, like you know, some tactic that's gonna like change us, something like a secret potion that's gonna make us better. No, he was coming in for that extra bit of motivation, that bit of uh, he's an icon. You know, he's he's our most capped national Experience, team player. Yeah. He's our most. He's he surpassed Ali Dai, you know, in in caps. Now he's the f- number one. So he has he is the most experienced Iranian footballer of all time, if you want to put it in that sense. So he is the biggest name when it comes to to numbers. So you know, he, it would have been good to have had him uh, in there, but of course that's not going to happen now. So um, we need to move on. Mm. All right, let's move on to another question that's widely asked, uh, not just in our national team but across every single national team. When is the final squad going to be announced? Um, like, when's that going to happen? Because the deadline is is set. And I think that's the 20th. Actually, I'm not going to say. I don't, I don't actually 14th, know. 14th, I heard. 14th of November. Yeah. Um, but obviously, they have the option to do it before. So is there any, like, what's going on there? I think Kirosh will do it up to the very last minute. <laughs> As usual. Yeah, I think I think he'll take his time. I think he'll, he'll wait until mm. all the league games are finished. He knows that he's got this these players available with no injuries, and he'll pick the squad. He's probably already picked it, but he'll finalize the squad and put it like his 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 uh, his uh, final um, signature on it once he knows everyone's fit and ready to go. At this rate, what are the potential surprises we could see? Any carryover from? Dragan Skosic that we could see in terms of guys who are kind of on the edge but will be kept or just will be dis- discarded. Uh, I-, I assume we'll probably find out with these friendlies, but it's still interesting mm. to see what will happen. Right? Because there's 26 potential players he can bring. More than 23 of the, of the past World Cups. 26 mm. now. So still the same uh, three goalies. Uh, and then uh, the rest uh, up to what he wants to decide because – the big uncertainties have been center mid, center defensive mid, and then who he decides uh, for uh, fullbacks and extra strikers, right? Definitely. Uh, 100%. I think that, I think you pretty much banged on there. I think fullback is is probably, I think, guaranteed that Roman Rezaian and, and Sadeq Muharami are the two right backs. Saleh Ardani actually got cut from this list. So it is going to be Muharami and Rezaian, the two right backs. Um, the left back issue, um, you know, me and Cena were at the game against Uruguay. I don't know what you thought, Cena, about uh, Jaloli. Um, he, apparently, Kiros is a massive fan of his. Abel Faz Jaloli, he played for I thought he well. played really well. I, me I too. really liked him. Yeah, yeah, me too. He he hasn't played regularly recently for Estetlo in the league, which put his place in a bit of doubt. He has, I think he started a recent game maybe for them. So I think he's back in the, the squad now. Um, whether he now he makes a final list, it's up for debate because Milad Mohammadi is now starting regularly for AK Athens. Uh, and he didn't play in the, in these two friendlies against Sen- Senegal and Algeria and um Uruguay, uh, whereas Hajj Safi did. So you know, maybe Milad Mohammadi now is the first choice left back at like, yeah, for Iran. So it's kind of up for debate. Nur Afghan is still an option. Obviously, Nur Afghan came into the camp late for, uh, in Vienna, so he didn't play any games. Um, so I I don't know what's going to happen, really, honestly. Actually, did, did Nur Afghan, no, Nur Afghan didn't even show up because he, he, he couldn't get a no. visa. 
for the camp. for the for the Vienna camp. So, so I think maybe he's still up for uh, for 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 choice. And I think that these will be decided in the Nicaragua game. Who plays? Who gets? Who gets the final call up? Who gets the final cut? Um, and I think um, again, strikers as you mentioned, Samson. You know, uh, it's a tough one because Ansari Fard. Um, scored a goal against Man United hasn't really done much else at Omonia but he is a top striker for this country you know uh, he he's somebody... the Euro yeah well. so you know he's somebody who we have to we rely on for experience as well he's one of the captains so he has to be there but then you look at Shahab Zahedi he's playing fantastically he scored, scored two fantastic goals just last week and looked really good so I, I think he's in for the show and you obviously got Ali Ali Poor as well, uh, who's not starting in the Portuguese league, but he's always in with a shout. So, and, and we'll I think, an, I, and I think, an underrated aspect going into the World Cup beyond Tarimi and as Moon is a fast, speedy substitute to bring on when when the of, offensive production will need a spark. It's probably going to happen. Who can provide that spark that's not named as Moon or Tarimi, uh, because those, I mean, I mean, I think I think Rolizar, they could fulfill that role. Yeah, well, I, I think I, can I see mean, that. I think I mean, since I do plays for Charleroi, the same club as is it is actually that that guy. I think he's he's been starting over it, but it's a day quite a lot in the Belgian league, and he seems to be, I think, guaranteed now to get in this list. There, uh, so he could be an option. Obviously, our our friend Alayar would have been great for that, but. Mm. Uh, it's not going to happen. So, so yeah. Uh, but what is it? Yeah, definitely could be an option as well. But I think that's probably one of the things that we lack, isn't it? Is is the pace in the forward areas? Yeah, especially especially from the wings. Like if if England are going to be playing Alexander Arnold, I would like I would like to have a winger that challenges that that fullback. Um, maybe Tarmi plays on on that left hand side. I don't know. Um, it could probably happen. But in terms of the defensive, in answer to your original question, Samson. I I think that's the biggest headache that Carlos Queiroz has, especially because England is an incredibly dangerous and the US and Wales with, with Gareth Bale from the from the flanks, from left and the right. Um, most of their chances come from that side, whether like with England, like Jack Grealish or Phil Foden, um, like Bukayo Saka. So that's the that's the part that I think he's got the real headache on. Um so it'll be interesting what call he takes, whether it's whether it's experience with Hodge Safi. But he could really get caught out, especially when there's pace. Or does he go with a less experienced, more pacey fullback? But it's a massive test against against these players. So I'm I'm very interested to see what he does. Of course, we also have to see who uh which superstar Amiri is going to nutmeg, right? <laughs> <laughs> we already did that against PK in, in uh uh in 2018 against Spain. That was oh, that was beautiful. I think that's when he made the retirement decision. So <laughs> he's retired now. Um, okay, so let's talk about the T- Tunisia game. So that's going to be happening. So the, the the deadline for the squad is two days before. And then the Tunisia game is on November 16th in Doha, as we as we mentioned. And this will be the final friendly. Um, so I guess this game, we're just hoping for no injuries. Five um, days. Five days. Yeah, less, less, less than a week. So it's, it's very, you know... But, but Tunisia, they're not in the World Cup. They've got nothing really to lose. So I don't really know what sort of game that will be. Um, what do we kind of want from that game, I guess? It'll be very different from the Nicaragua game. We'll, we'll cover that when, when we get to the, the, the next podcast. But yeah, I think it's going to be a game where, you know, you want to see if we can watch it, of course, if it's broadcast. You know, we want to see uh, the key players starting. I, I don't think that Kiros will play all his cards, though, in this game. I think he will still be a little bit more you know, um, just subdued with how, how he goes about selection, you know, might play players at different minutes of the game just to make sure that England don't get any ideas. Uh, so I think he will do that. But I think, you know, I, I want to see us, of course, win this game. That's massive. But I think it's important that we continue from the Senegal and Uruguay game, which we played really well uh, in those two matches. Uh, so this will be a game where we want to see the, that again, you know, we want to see us play that in the same way in that in that game. Mm. Okay, cool. And uh, uh yeah. quick 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 uh fact check uh Sina uh Tunisia is in the World Cup. They are in group D yeah. uh along with France. Oh Aust- my bad. Uh, France, bad France, Australia, 
and Denmark. They're obviously not favored to advance. They've kind of been overlooked in that group, so I don't really blame you. Apologies uh, to any Tunisians listening. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, so it looks like they're both going to go with uh, what I would guess is starting lineups heading into uh, first uh, for first matches. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see. No, kind of Tunisia is a... Tunisia is a strong team. Yeah, Tunisia is a strong team. You know, they're not they're not they're not terrible. I mean, obviously they qualify for the World Cup, and you know they they've always had good players. You know, they've always had good players. Wabi Kazri, for example, is a very important player for them. I don't know if he's still going to be in the squad, but they've always had good players, produce good players. So I think they're still going to be a challenge for us. But the way we played against uh, Senegal we should be able to beat them. Well, they'll be better than Algeria was when we lost to them. But yeah, that was, that's true. It felt like that was a thousand years ago. That was under uh, Scotich though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A question slightly outside of football. A lot of these big teams, a lot of big teams have announced their kits and a lot of them look amazing. Iran hasn't done so. So oh, what's going on there? We, I, I, want a, I want a new Iran kit. I'm going to the game oh, and I can't wear anything. What's oh, going on there? Just, just, just bring a red T-shirt and a white T-shirt, mate. <laughs> and there was supposed to be a, a kit that was uh, supplied by Maruj or Majid, the sponsors of this uh, national team. Um, they supplied a kit to the federation as like a a sample uh, that had like uh, details on its shoulders. It looked quite, it looked quite nice. It was quite a, it was you can tell that was an Iranian national team jersey. This that you probably see now on your oh, screen. Oh, was with like the Persian rug details on the shoulder. Yeah, was yeah. That, that one looked, looked amazing. I love that. It looked that. great, but apparently the, yeah. the, the Federation rejected it. And they said, we don't want that design, which is ridiculous. It's like, how, how are you qualified to tell somebody who's qualified in this field what's good and what's bad? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, what are you doing? How about you just stick back to your job, which you don't do properly anyway? You know, uh, do that, do that properly as much as you can, and then come back and speak to these guys and tell them what they can and can't do. You know, rather than talking like all this rubbish or this detail isn't good, give me a break, man. Like, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be overly critical, but like we experienced out in, um, out in, uh, in, in Vienna, it wasn't as if they were wearing some fantastic gear anyway. You know, it's not like they were wearing some world class gear. At least make it look nice. You know what I mean? Like, just make it look a bit yeah. decent. It's one of those subtle things that I actually think does build confidence in players, like wearing a kit where they can actually be proud of it. You know, and I don't think the kits that we have right now deliver that whatsoever. No, no, I, I, I feel like uh, they, they took a look at the United States Walmart looking, uh, you know, second rate kits and they thought, hold my chai. <laughs> let's let's do something even less inspired than that. And no, I mean, it is. I mean, you can see it on your screen. It is literally a white and red T-shirt with, with like, slight with... slight cheetah. Oh come on! on, the, on it, the it makes like... it look dirty. Yeah, it makes <laughs> it look dirty. It makes it look like it's not supposed to be there. Mm. You know what I mean? It, and it's like, and that's a shame so... because we still get. I mean, we still got. I mean, my claws over here, my brother. Uh, we still got people wearing the '98 kits. That, I mean, that's iconic. That's it's the bad. one. That's what I'm going to wear at the thing tournament. Is, that's the one I'm going to wear at the tournament. The thing is, like, I really like the cheetah design on 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 the on the chest or on, on the stomach area before. That was nice. It, it was it was more apparent. Like just having a little bit of like detail on the shoulder. It doesn't. It doesn't even look like it's a cheetah design. This, when I say it was dirty, I don't mean it's dirty as if it's a bad thing to do. I think it's just, it doesn't even look like it's supposed to be that, you know? So, I don't know. It's just not good at yeah, all. But... It's, 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 it's a very important, non-important thing to, to, at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, it's a great symbol because obviously uh, cheetahs are ex are going extinct and they're uh, under threat in, the, in, in Iran, no doubt about it. And they should be supported in the right way. But I feel like they haven't been. I mean, even in the 2018 World Cup, the, the lo there was like a little dot on the chest with a cheetah a face on it. I mean, like, I get it. It's not bad. But like, I, I think the detail that it had in the 2014 World Cup was a lot better. But it is what it is. You know, we're not, we're not, mm. we're not um, obviously designers uh, ourselves. We did see a video that popped up of Taimurian and Rahmati showed up to training. 
And what's interesting about that is because they both had issues with Carlos Queiroz before, and we'll obviously overlay the video so you can see it. The relationship between me and Carlos Queiroz was not good. بلکه رابطه خیلی سمیمانه با هم داشتیم خیلی, okay. خیلی رابطه همون با هم خوب بود تا, تا اونجایی که حتی بازی کره ایشون تو جلسه فنی برگشت گفتش که آقا من بابت دروازه مشکل ندارم هرچی میخوام بزنم بذارید شوت بزنن من بهترین دروازه من آسیا رو تو دروازه دارم تو جلسه همین تو جلسه کره ای که تو... اینجا یکی بردیم بله کره ای که اینجا یکیش بردیم ولی بعدش یه سری مسائلی مطرح شد فردوسی پور که حالا دوستان یه سری مسائلی مطرح شد منم اون اون کاری رو که کردم اون تصمیمی رو که گرفتم میخواستم از صحت و سقم اون صحبت ها با خبر بشم ببینید آقای کروش سرمربی تیم ملیه به نوعی نقش پدر خانواده رو داره آیا وقتی یه پسر به پدرش میگه آقا من امشب احتمال داره خونه نیام باباش میگه نیا یا میگه واسه چی نمیای به هر حال میگم تو این مقطع الان شرایطی نیستش که من بخوام ها پسره میره به باباش میگه بابا من نمیام خونه نمیره تو رسانا بگه ببین خب اون موقع بابای ما نبود ایران خب باباتون بود. باباتون تلفن داره <تصفح> من تلفن ایمیل داره گفتم که فدوسی بود من خب دیگه راهش نگاه پسر میخواد نیاد خونه به باباش یه جوری اطلاع بده نه که به تو روزنامه و تو رسانا بگه آقا بابا من دیگه نمیام خونه ها فدوسی بود بابا میگه نه یابو خود شما میدونی که این فقط در مورد من این اتفاق افتاد حالا دوست ندارم اصلا بحث کسی دیگه رو بکنم ولی کسی دیگه هم این کارو کردن یعنی چه اتفاقی واسهشون نیافتاد یه هینتی بده آقا چه هینتی بده نه مثلا نه یعنی مثلا یه چه یه اشاره بکن به مثلا کی آخه کی خود مثلا خدای داوری مصاحبه نکرده و با روزنامه آلمانی که من نمیتونم برم تیم ملی تیم من بازی مهم داره سر اون بازی آره خواهنو دعوت نشده بود یعنی اصلا تو چارچوب بازیکن تیم ملی قرار نگرفته بود دعوت شده بود آی فردوسی بود میگم تو این مقطع شرایطی حساس نمیشه به این چیزا حاشیه درست که واسه تیم ملی دامن زد ترجیح میدم که چون خودم همیشه آرزوی قلبی موفقیت تیم ملی بوده چه خودم بودم چه نبودم با جون دل دعا کردم امیدوارم که همیشه تیم ملی موفق باشه آقای کروشم تو تیم ملی موفق باشه و بهترین نتایج رو بگیره آقای فردوسی بود Before, I guess, like it's quite interesting. What was the problem originally, Arya, with with both of those players, with Carlos Queiroz? Well, with Rahmati, it's happened a long time ago, so I think things have probably just passed now. Uh, when he was picking the squad for the 2014 World Cup, obviously Rahmati wasn't in the final squad. Um, he got dropped quite early on uh, by by Queiroz and. Uh, It was for various reasons, but I think one of the things that was, it was obviously the video you'll see. He um, he criticizes Kiroz for calling up Daniel Davari. If you remember, he was a German Iranian uh, goalkeeper. Uh, was called up uh, by Kiroz for the World Cup. Um, he criticized him for that on on Navad, and you know I think um, it put maybe a bad taste in a lot of Iranian football fans' mouths uh, that he had that kind of thing to say on national TV. Uh, so. But obviously, it seems to have passed over now. He, he's he's went and he's shaking his hand, so it seems all good. Um, and with Tamori on, you might remember that show Yazda that we actually spoke about uh last beginning of this year, maybe be, end of last year. We had a lot of podcasts about it because they were just saying a lot of like controversial stuff constantly. A a a TV show that that um had uh, Azizi, Karimi, uh Jabbari. And uh, I think for this episode, they had Tamori on. Uh, maybe he's a regular as well, but they were speaking about Kiroz. And uh, obviously, this was during the qualification where Scotland was still in charge. And um, you can see, you can translate it. Basically, he was speaking about how uh, Kiroz didn't want an old sport sponsor for the 2014 World Cup because he did, the quality wasn't good. Um, and he ended up... Um, getting paid $100,000 by Ill Sport to allow that to happen, which it seems like a really strange accusation to me. I don't think, I don't think, first of all, I don't think Ill Sport would pay $100,000 to anybody, right, to sponsor them. Does that make, how how can a sponsor pay you to sponsor them? Like, it's meant to be the other way around. You meant to pay them or, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, Or they provide the kit and that's it. They don't pay you a hundred thousand dollars to then you spot. Nah, what Man, are you on about? And never mind the fact that uh, every World Cup, an Iran kit, if you're in and you living in a Western country, is almost impossible to get. So he criticized him for that, whatever it was. He was accusing him or whatever it was, and uh, 
uh, it seems to have blown over now. So, uh, I think it's just it's it's. I think one of the things I think that what we can take away from this is 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 know when to keep your mouth shut. Like that's that's the truth. You're a footballer, and we've seen it with like Tara me as well on on Instagram or on Twitter. They speak too much, and I think it's like sometimes just like it's better to be quiet. You know, sometimes it's better to be quiet, and even in in respect to the protest, sometimes it's better to rather than just taking the middle ground and and saying things to like just please people, just just don't speak because sometimes people Iranian players have a have a emotional undertone about what they say, and it and it and it comes across the wrong way. And it's like you're better off just not talking because you're just gonna make it worse for yourself. This is one of those situations. Yeah, we don't really have a long queue of brands wanting to like <laughs> provide yeah. our kits for us. Like, I mean, you can see it from the kit that we've got right now. It's like it's not that good, and we haven't had a new kit for a while, really. Yeah. Um, so I doubt a brand like Allsport, who's actually like a fairly well respected uh, brand in Germany, right? They're not bad. Yeah. They wouldn't. They wouldn't pay that level of money to in order to do it. They, if they wanted to do it, they probably could do it anyway because they they were they used, they did work with us at one point. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It seems a bit strange to me. It seems a bit. And plus, like Carlos Gosh was being paid more than that, wasn't he? Like, so it's not. It's not even like a game changing amount of money for him. So I don't really know. It doesn't really add up in my opinion. Um, it's a very strange accusation. Uh, yeah, that's it. Nothing else to add about. Yeah. That. Okay, so let's move on quickly. So we'll cover this very, very quickly about the Champions League and other European draws um, to look out for because these games will be played after the World Cup and obviously we'll cover them close to the time. But just uh, just to let you guys know, the, the Champions League draw was done, I think it was today actually, so time of recording. Um, and Porto, Meditarium's team, was with is with Inter Milan. So that's a nice, nice fixture. Um, and Tyrone has been playing in immensely well in the Champions League, so I can't wait to see that fixture. Um, and I love how I love the form that he's that he's got at the moment coming into the World Cup. It's it's amazing to see. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll talk about as well very quickly Moharami's performances in um, in the Champions League. He did get knocked out, but I think the performance that he put in against Chelsea was very very good. I I liked seeing him in that against Raheem Sterling, and he and he, and he matched up very very well against him. In my opinion, yeah. Uh, obviously, um, on target me. Yeah, it's good to see that he's he's, he's in a round of sixteen now, playing against Inter Milan, who obviously are, are a strong Serie A team. I think that's going to be a good test for him. Um, uh, yeah, but you're hundred percent right. Moharami had very good performances against AC Milan. He played really well. Um, didn't really have any bad games against them. Uh, I didn't watch his last game against Chelsea, but I heard he didn't do too badly. He overall he played really well and he's got he's getting good game time now uh in the Croatian league and in the Champions League. So yes, he got knocked out, but it's been a fantastic experience for him. I think he's put himself in the market as well for, for a, a, a transfer in the summer potentially. Yeah, especially if he does well in the World Cup, then for yeah. sure. Yeah, and especially leading into the World Cup. This is his, gonna be his first World Cup. Tarmi won't be his first. Mm. Uh so this this is exactly what they need for confidence yeah. especially the fact that being european based players they won't yeah. be able to go until next week this is exactly what he needs he, there's no question uh at least for our european based uh, defenders like you know uh hosseini and, and moharami they are ready to answer the call and by the way uh aria feel free to expand on this that assist that uh that uh hosseini had the other day yeah, he was fantastic. I thought he had a great assist. You know, he got got past two players. I think we can't show it for copyright reasons, but he got past two players and he was very good at with the final pass. And uh, he seems to be in very good form at the moment for Kayseri Sport. He seems to be doing really well. And I think he's uh, he's hitting peak at the right time. Um, but also on Moharami as well, I think it's important because he's playing in a key role. He played against Pulisic uh, up against Chelsea. You know, he came up against him, obviously against Ryan Sterling as well. So he's played against opponents that he's going to face at the World Cup. Um, and that's good because that's good. You know, he's in a role where Cairo has always been a little bit more. Uh, he's not really f- tried to be too f- flexible with, you know, in the World Cup. He played in 2014, where he played Montazeri there and stuck with him and played a, 
a good game, a good World Cup, Montezelli, but he was a, he was a centre back playing at right back. In the twenty four in twenty eighteen World Cup, he stuck with uh, Reza Yon despite bad uh, club performances at times for Reza Yon. He stuck with him and you know uh, made sure that and he played really well as well. Um, and now it's it's uh, Moharami's turn, so I think he's he has to show up show up and and do what uh, Reza Yon did in, in twenty eighteen. And going into the World Cup, you have to have confidence going in. Bukarish had to instill confidence in the players going into. Uh, the matches against Argentina in 2018, going into uh, Morocco and... Uh, 2014 and, and, Argentina. Yeah, 2014 Argentina yeah. and 2018 against uh, Morocco and then Spain, and, you know, not really knowing who the, you know, the, the, the fullbacks would be, having to make those adjustments, as you, as you just said. Mm. Now it's a different story, and you need that going into England. And then you look at the fact that, well, last time they were out, uh, they got blown away by Hungary. So no. there's no conf- there's no absence of confidence to be found. And that's, a, as a defender, you need that going up against those speedy wingers that England will have as, as the first game. You get it out of the way, realize that they can get at least four points from the other games and have a chance to advance because uh, it starts from the back. And in order to have... Uh, that you must have a confident keeper leading the way, and then the defenders who are you know kicking butt in in, in Europe. That's that's what you need. So on that, and right now as we record this episode, um, it we're in a confident place right now. We can't get a, ahead of ourselves, but it, this is where we want to be. If if you're looking at the Iranian defense, mm-hmm. I completely agree. And obviously, relative confidence. England confidence is very low at the moment. Like they were talking about sacking Gareth Southgate and and the other teams, as you mentioned, Samson, early in the episode, like relatively we're we're doing pretty good, like touch wood, of course. So yeah, it's it's exciting times for sure. Um yeah. from a football standpoint, at least for the country. Okay. So apart apart from those two we talked about the Champions League, uh outside the Champions League, the Europa League. Um by Leverkusen, who uh, Osman's team, they were knocked out. Osman was obviously injured. Um, Patrick Schick wasn't really performing too well, who's, you know, the other goal scorer. Um, they got knocked out and they're now in the Europa League um, and they're against Monaco. So hopefully, probably Osman will be back for the round of 60, uh, round of 32, sorry, not round of 60, round of 32, because um, Europa League is longer. And then uh, finals, who's Jan Bash's team, they've gone through to the Europa League round of 16 um, through getting first in the group. So yeah, those are, those are all the European ties, which are very exciting. And um, they're going to all happen after the World Cup. So we'll cover them when the time comes. You guys yeah. have anything to say on the Europa, European no, ties? It's just, no, it's just uh, you know, good fixtures. And obviously, hopefully, uh, maybe Leverkusen can go all the way. There's a chance for that to happen. Uh, they're they're a strong team despite some bad performances, and they they could go all the way. So that's it for the episode. We're going to wrap up there, guys. Is there anything else you want to add? It's all nope. good. That's all from me. Yeah. All right. Uh, fantastic. It's it's getting close, boys. It's time to put on our World Cup caps right here. <laughs> so got our <laughs> so got our ninety four ninety four U S uh World Cup hat, which uh, hopefully we'll see Ron in 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 about four years, <laughs> but. Uh, uh man, it's it's getting close, and I'd be even more excited if I was if I were you, Cena. But um, oh, I'm excited. I, I, I'm excited yeah. not just for the the games, but also selfishly for the coverage that we're gonna bring. I mean, we're we're gonna put together some <laughs> some neat stuff, and uh, we hope that uh, our listeners will stay tuned and and tell uh, your friends and family as well, because uh, we're gonna be working extra to get uh get some good content for us. Yeah. So, so definitely follow us because I'm going to be going. Alex from our yeah. team is going to be going as well. So we're going to be videoing a few things here and there, bringing you some behind the scenes of what it's like. So yeah, definitely follow us if you don't already. Um, Guys, predictions for these two friendlies then before we finish. Oh, yeah, we got to do that. <laughs> so let me just like reiterate. So the, yeah, the, the Nicaragua game is on the, ten- the 10th of November and then the Tunisia game is on the 16th of November. So yeah, predictions. Samson, what do you think? I, I gotta go conservative. Uh, maybe uh, it depends on the lineup, but at, I mean, conservatively, I, I guess three zero for Nicaragua. Uh, I mean, it's not like they're gonna be 
I, I, I don't know. It depends on the tactics, but I, I would I would just go on a whim and say three zero. Uh, for Tunisia, uh, they they usually underwhelm at, and and give no clear cut showing of what the World Cup will turn out to be. I mean, very uh, uh underwhelming performances right before the last two World Cups, but it, it didn't mean anything. So I I would guess maybe one 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 zero in favor of Iran for the Tunisia game, but. I, I wouldn't read too much into the final result. Well, I, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna go right through Nicaragua. I don't think they can. They can handle us. And with all due respect, again, I, I just don't think that they have much for us. Even with the players that are playing for us, I think we will probably score a lot of goals, five or six goals against Nicaragua. That's. I think. I think that's possible. <laughs> it's Honestly. not even our first team, though. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If only, if only, <laughs> if only were, were here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, here. I'm gonna get a lot of Nicaraguan fans coming onto <laughs> my, to my social media. <laughs> no, nah, let, let's be real. I we're apologize. Probably, they're, I just, they're getting ready for the winter baseball season. Let's be real. <laughs> uh, and I think for Tunisia's game, I think, uh, I think they've had a couple of injuries, if I'm not mistaken. So I think we should be able to, to, to beat them. Uh, but I think it will be uh, like you said, maybe a, a one nil, two, two nil. Take, take I think score. I think what's more important for for Carlos Quares is to get clean sheets into in these both games, rather than like offensive, in my opinion. So yes, right. that's that's what I really want to see. Nicaragua, maybe not five or six nil. I see it maybe as a two nil. Uh, okay, you, we'll, we'll put a more, we'll put more a structured. On it. We'll put a or f- on it. five nil versus like two nil. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if we could do that. Um, and then uh, for the Tunisia game, I see it as a one nil. Um, yeah. but very, very organized, which is what I'm hoping to see. Yeah. One nil victory, by the way. I, I still think there's going to be a few defensive adjustments to make after. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, one garbage goal is scored for Tunisia, 1-1, one, 2-1, one, one, that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't really want to see that, but could happen. Who knows? All right, so thank you so much, Arya, Samson, for coming on the podcast with me. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, then do leave a rating. If you're on YouTube, subscribe and leave a nice little comment saying, I love seeing your pretty faces. We'll have some more of the more of that in the future. And yeah, that's it from us, from Golbazan, and we'll see you in the next episode. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray from ESPN and EA Sports. You're listening to Gold Bazan Podcast.